the exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. We have had our failures, but so have others, even if they do not admit them, and they may be less public. To be sure, to be sure we are behind, and will be behind for some time in man flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first, and to become the world's leading spacefaring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. If I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this decade is out, then we must be bold. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. It will be done during the terms of office of some of the people who sit here on this platform. But it will be done, and it will be done before the end of this decade. And I am delighted that this university is playing a part in putting a man on the moon as part of a great national effort of the United States of America. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts, 6, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift up on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Saturn V's first stage launched Apollo, carrying the spacecraft 42 miles above the Earth and reaching a speed of about 6,000 miles per hour. The first stage then detached, and once the Saturn V's second stage kicked in, the now needless launch escape system jettisoned too. The second stage propelled the spacecraft even farther and faster into space, and after it detached, the third stage of the rocket fired briefly to knock Apollo into a parking orbit, 103 miles above the Earth's surface. 
Here, final checks were made, and the Saturn V fired again to set Apollo on course to the moon in a move called the Translunar Injection. Once the spacecraft propelled away from Earth, the Saturn V's job was done. Now, the astronauts needed to pull off a mid-flight maneuver to reconfigure the ship so the crew could access the lunar module, which had been stored in a protective compartment during launch. To do this, the command service module detached and flipped 180 degrees, docking with the lunar module and extracting it. In the process, they ditched the third, now useless, stage of the Saturn rocket. This whole high-stakes launch process only took about three and a half hours, and this, the completed Apollo spacecraft, was the end result. For the next three days, Apollo coasted through space, until it finally reached its target and was pulled into orbit by the moon's gravity. This is where the crew split up. Armstrong and Aldrin transferred to the lunar module, named Eagle, and slowly descended toward the surface, while Collins continued to circle the moon in the command module, called Columbia. Now, here comes another tricky part, landing on the moon. To make this historic moment happen, Eagle turned and used its engine to slow its momentum and ultimately touch down on the lunar surface. The Eagle has landed. The moonwalk was broadcast live on television, immortalizing Neil Armstrong's words here. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think that was Neil's quote. I didn't understand it. <laughs> no, one small step for man, but I didn't get the second phrase. After about 21 and a half hours on the moon, Eagle performed the first launch from a celestial body that wasn't Earth, leaving its landing gear behind and timing its ascent with Columbia's path in lunar orbit to rejoin the spacecraft. Once Armstrong and Aldrin transferred back into the command module, the lunar module was no longer needed. Just like before, Apollo needed to break out of orbit. This maneuver was called the Trans-Earth Injection and began the two and a half day journey home. Upon approaching its entry point into Earth's atmosphere and no longer needing its propulsion engines, Apollo jettisoned the service module and prepared for re-entry, protected by the now exposed heat shield on the bottom of the command module. Apollo blazes across the heavens, coming back to Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. Parachutes deployed and Columbia splashed down safely into the Pacific Ocean and what was once a 3,000-ton behemoth of rocket, fuel, and freight was reduced to this, a small command module floating in the ocean, carrying three astronauts and rock samples collected from the surface of the moon. This limb weighed 33,000 pounds, and it dropped onto the moon using only one engine. But on all, and I mean all, the moon landings, all six times, there is no crater, there is no dust blown away. This is typical of each landing. So the only conclusion is that this guy was put here by a crane. Houston, we are activating the camera. Roger, Kepler. Houston, you should have a picture now. We have a pretty good picture now. Houston, I am out of the hatch. I'm on the ladder. Houston, the suit is functioning. The ladder is steady. I am three steps from the bottom. I'm two steps from the bottom. Houston, I'm on the bottom step. Houston, I'm going to set foot on the surface. Ready, slow mo. I take this step in the journey of peace for all mankind. Hey! Slow mo. I am on the surface. Roger, Capricorn. We copy. I'm starting to walk now. Houston, the surface is solid. Visibility is good. I'm walking toward the camera. The footing is solid. The surface seems powdery. I'm picking up the camera now. I have the camera. The picture will get shaky for a while. The footing is good. Houston, I am setting the camera down now. The rocks seem very porous. Houston, I am outside the hatch. Houston, I am on the ladder. Ready, slow mo. Houston, I'm stepping onto the surface. Take slow mo. I'm on the surface. We are going to set the flag on the surface. We do 
not claim this planet in the name of America. We claim it in the name of all the people of the planet Earth. We hope that our visit will increase the understanding of the human race. Walker should be activating the tape soon with the pre-recorded message from the president. Houston, I am starting the tape. To them, your fellow Americans and all of the citizens of the world. You are so far away. It takes light more than 20 minutes to reach you from here. One could say not only light, one could say time. You are in another time from us. The future, we will never be the same. For this moment, more than any moment in our history, has made all of the people in the world realize that we are part of a planet that is part of a system, that is part of a universe. We are a small, energetic species, capable of pettiness, yet capable of brilliance. We know how bad we can be. Now you, the men of Capricorn One, have shown us how wonderful we can be by showing us how high we can reach. You have crossed the last great frontier, and you have shown us what we are, people of different colors and religions and ideologies. However, a single people. You are the basic truth in us. You are the reality. We will never let you down. And we will always be grateful. Oh, the marvels of American science. Here we are, millions of miles from Earth, we can still send out for pizza. Good morning. Hi there, Dr. Calloway. Nice to see you. A funny thing happened on the way to Mars. Well, why don't you all sit down? Okay, here it is. I have to start by saying that if there was any other way, if there was even the slight chance of another alternative, I would give anything not to be here with you now, anything. I remember when Glenn made his first orbit in Mercury. They put up television sets in Grand Central Station and tens of thousands of people missed their trains to watch. You know, when Apollo 17 landed on the moon, people were calling up the networks and bitching because reruns of I Love Lucy were canceled. Reruns, for Christ's sake. I can understand if it was a new Lucy show. I mean, what the hell is a walk on the moon? But reruns. Oh, jeez. And then suddenly everybody started talking about how much everything cost. Was it really worth 20 billion to go to another planet? What about cancer? What about the slums? How much does it cost? How much does any dream cost, for Christ's sake? Since when is there an accountant for ideas? And so there we are. After all those hopes and all that dreaming, he sits there with those flags behind his chair and tells me we can't afford a screw-up. And guess what? We had a screw-up. A first-class, bona fide, made-in-America screw-up. The good people from Con Amalgamate delivered a life support system cheap enough so they could make a profit on the deal. Works out fine for everybody. Con Amalgamate makes money. We have our life support system. Everything's peachy. Except they made a little bit too much profit. We found out two months ago, it won't work. You guys would all be dead in three weeks. It's as simple as that. So all I have to do is report that and scrub the mission. Congress has its excuse. The president still has his desk and we have no more program. What's 16 years for actual drop in the bucket? All right, that's the end of the speech. Now we're getting to what they call the moment of truth. Come with me. I want to show you something. Roger, Houston. TMI burn time will be five minutes, 45 seconds. Roger. 
Patrick here. Delta V burn time, 3.3 seconds. There's a door here. I'm going to open it and walk into another area. If you follow me, you'll see a bit more. I'll answer some questions, and you're going to... Why don't you just follow me?